Hey there, everybody. I'm Maisie. I'm Tegan. And we are starting a podcast called The Quirky Quirky Crimes. You got it. It's fine. (laughs) We're going to be talking about all things crime related, serial killers, just killers in general, things that don't make sense. So we're going to put out a detective hat on. We're going to talk about them and then we're going to, you know, tell you our thoughts on yeah. killers and crimes so for our first episode we're doing the zodiac killer who i i've always thought was like really cool i was talking the zodiac about killer. yeah i was oh uh, we don't know if it's a guy there's so many theories on that but i was talking about them to i think my mom the other day and she didn't mm-hmm. know who they were and i'm like the zodiac killer like <laughs> it's got to be one of the most famous like unsolved serial killers out there because you know so many like movies and documentaries have been made on it like while while i was doing research on this there's a movie called um zodiac uh, that was made in 2007 and it literally consists of like mark ruffalo jake gyllenhaal robert downey jr i was like wow it's 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 quite it's, it's captivated the world this zodiac killer Honestly, I haven't done a heap of research on it because you did say you were going to do it. So I'm like, oh, you've got it. It's fine. Um, but I do know some of the things and like a few of the theories they have. And it's just like so like I even saw somewhere where they talked about how in one of his letters, I think they said that they um covered their fingers in c- cement or something just a little bit. So none of their DNA or fingerprints got in any of their crime scene. Just a little bit of cement. Yeah, just thinking. a little bit. <laughs> um, I just think, no, because I was going to do all the research for this, but there's just so much out there. Yeah. Like, I literally probably got as far. I We're going to talk about the main sort of, like, the first lost killings and all that sort of stuff. But um, the first, like, even just as the first killing, um, like, there's just so much information, which is... It just seems so crazy considering we don't know who the killer actually was. Yeah, it's so weird to think that cases like this have so much information and that you still can't, like, figure it out or anything. And then there's other cases where you know who it is and there's so much less information on them. Yeah, exactly. Like, it was kind of lucky that they found out, like, take Ted Bundy for example. Ted Bundy was so dumb. (laughs) really dumb he could have he could have done a lot better but that's fine we'll talk about that on another episode so um i reckon we just get straight into it yeah so the zodiac killer um it's quite funny that he was such a famous killer considering he went on a crime spree that only lasted less than a year you hear about serial killers that go on for years and years killing without um, anyone finding out who they are or even that they're killing. But um, Zodiac Killer only has known um, killings for about a year. Um, I thought it was longer than that. Oh, that's so interesting that it was, like, that short. Because I really thought there was, like, at least a few years there where he was killing people especially when you think about like all the other serial killers that are like constantly killing people at last like I know some of the last like decades and then he was just under a year that's so weird oh sorry I think I I think I cut out but welcome to the first podcast everybody (laughs) um yeah so yeah he was like when you think so he said like he claimed to have killed around 37 people but it's only recognized by authorities and proven that he killed five um but even so like 37 in it less than a year yeah impressive (laughs) yeah so we'll start with the first one on the night of december the 20th 1968 at around 11 15 p.m david arthur farday and betty lou jensen aged 17 and 16 respectively was sitting in Farday's station wagon on the gravel parking area along Lake, Lake Herman Road on the eastern outskirts of Vallejo, California. The young couple had been on their first date together and they pulled over next to a petrol station. No one really knows why. Maybe they uh, were getting a little you know, 
know, just excited about a first date. Who knows? Um, but they, they pulled over and it's not known what happens over the next sort of 25 to 30 minutes. But from the evidence, it looks like the Zodiac Killer um, was also in that in that car, being, car park in the petrol station or he was around that area and he had a gun and he fired several shots into the car without shooting either um, David or Betty. And obviously the shots caused David and Betty to get out of the car probably quite quickly. I feel like if someone was shooting into my car, I would get out pretty quickly. Um, and basically what happened was David was shot once in the head at point blank range and he died within minutes. And Betty was shot five times in her back and she died instantly. Um, the police got there at 11.45 or 11.50 and said that the scene was absolutely like sort of horrendous. There was um, blood coming out of like on the floor. Um, yeah. I so, feel like that's a really ballsy move to be like, yeah, in the car and just start shooting in it. When you think about that, a lot of serial killers are like very meticulous, very clean with what they do. They never, they would never leave a mess like that most of the time. So to have him just shooting into the car and just to leave that sort of mess mm. is just, it's it fine. seems strange. I'm going to send you some crime scene photos. And there's this one that's quite haunting. It's a picture of the car. Um, and they, the police did a, like a, had a chalk outline of where the bodies were and just the sheer amount of blood that's oh, next wow. to like the head. Yeah. But you'd also it's think crazy. if he was shooting into the car that many times and didn't hit either of them, it doesn't seem like he was A, a good shot or B, really knew what he was doing. Maybe that's why he, like, both of them died from, like, especially a David, you know, he, they, he shot point blank into the back of his head. Like, that was the only way you could get the shot. Yeah. Uh, like, it would either have to be that they, he, like, the killer didn't know what he, they were doing or they wanted it to seem like they didn't know what they were doing. I don't know. It's all a little bit. Maybe it was just, you know, his, his first. Just but his I feel first like time. <laughs> <laughs> we should give him some slack no, yeah no. um but i think like you talk i don't know i watch i'm a bit of a crime junkie i watch like really bad american tv shows like fbi and criminal minds and you hear them talking about how like a serial killer doesn't just start with a murder like they do like smaller crimes beforehand and then it like leads into yeah. something like this i don't know yeah so as I said before, um, the killings happen. So that first one, it's not proven to be a Zodiac killer. Like, it's not proven to be him, but a lot of people suspect it is because that was his MO. He would um, kill couples, specifically young couples, in cars. So, you know, fits to that. Um, his second kill was on July the 4th, 1969, Michael Manigou and Darlene Farron were shot in the Blue Rock Springs Blue oh, I can't say today. Blue Rock Springs Park in the same town of Valdio in California. Um, Michael survived the shooting. Unfortunately Darlene didn't. There's not much just really known about this this one. You would think there'd be more account from Michael having survived that. Like Yeah being able to give them more information i don't know it's all a little bit i think at this time specifically you know it was the same town had had you know young two lots of young couples within what was it july to december to july i don't know honestly if you're parking your car at like <laughs> almost midnight like, near gas stations at the edge of the road in, like, abandoned areas to make out, do whatever. Like, I don't see the logic behind it. Like, I get why you would want to, 
But it's also not a very smart move, especially when a couple has already been killed there. Like, you're kind of just, like, handing yourself some almost. I think this one's quite interesting because a lot of people think the reason they were in a car on, like, a secluded highway is because um, Darlene was married. She had a husband, James Phillips Crabtree, who was initially a suspect, quite obviously, because, you know, his wife was cheating on him. Um, But, yeah, so he had the same MO. Um, Darlene was shot five times, but unlike the first murder, Mike was shot four times instead of just once in the back of the head. So it seems like he's kind of getting, I don't know, getting more overkill. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just thinking with that many shots, they would have bullets. You'd think they'd be able to trace the gun or something like that. Mm. This one, um, the attack happened... Uh, so the police didn't get to the attack until after 45 minutes later because, you know, no one around, no one was around to look at, sorry, no one was around to hear them. But the police only were aware of the, um, well, oh my gosh, I really can't speak today. <laughs> police were only aware of the attack because a man claiming to be the attacker phoned the police station. Um, he said that the weapon that he used was a 9 millimeter. It was a 9 millimeter. And he also took credits for the earlier murders. Um, it was like, because, you know, the, um, the he, he's very, well, sorry, we don't know if it's he, but the killer, he's starting to get a taste of, like, playing along with the police department. And he's, like, calling in and he's like, oh, I know who did this. It was me. And obviously Zodiac, he goes along with it and he keeps it up for quite a while. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things I find about, like, the Zodiac Killer case is how much they played with the police and all the mind games they had. And I guess I never really knew, like, much about the murders until now, and it just doesn't seem like the same person that would be murdering these people and then playing those mind games with the police. Like, they seem like two very different types of people. Mm. So after the second murders... The police had nothing like they this was back when you couldn't trace calls that well so you know they couldn't really trace the call to the man who called the police department but on the july the 31st 1969 letters were sent to the times herald for valajos like you know the um town newspaper um also was sent to san francisco examiner and the san francisco chronicle all of these letters claim to be from the killer of Faraday, Jensen, and Farron. Uh, details were included that only the killer could have known, and each of these letters contained a cipher that, if sold, supposedly contained his identity. Um, and he gave himself Zodiac in this time. He gave himself the name of Zodiac when he sent in the letters, which I feel like is such a ballsy move. Imagine just yeah. being like, yo, I've killed three people and I'm going to give myself a name. Honestly, I mean, it's a power move. If you do that, like, if you're going to kill that many people, you may as well get the credit. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he, you know, when there are the killers and all this sort of stuff, the it's the media that gives them the name. It's like, oh, the hillside stranglers because they were literally strangling in a hill. Um, but this time he was like, you know what, I'm going to give myself a name. It was like, it's like choosing a nickname for yourself and then making everyone else in the schoolyard call you that. (laughs) It seems like something that they would have planned out for a while before they actually started to kill people. Like, it doesn't seem like it's just like a... They just started killing people. I feel like there's a lot of planning behind it. I agree with you, though. When when I was like looking into this case, the people that who who were like sorry, the person that is committing these murders versus the person that is sending these letters, they just feel like two completely different people. Like the murders are quite messy. They're like a messy scene, whereas these letters and these ciphers are so precise and like he had to have spent a long time trying to figure them out like um you know the the ciphers still haven't been able to be cracked today i feel like 
it sort of plays into that theory that the Zodiac Killer wasn't just one person, it was two or more people. Because... Mm. Or someone I, with split personalities. True, that's also a really good theory, just having, like, two personalities. Because I feel like someone that is that messy when murdering people, like they were, would not be the same person that would be writing these codes that we still can't crack now. Mm, exactly. Just a note on this murder before you leave. You were talking about how um, the partner, Mike Magoo, he stayed alive um, mm. and, and how he should have been able to give like more evidence. Um, in 1991, Mike identified Arthur Lee Allen as being the shooter. Um, this was like, this became the result of, he was shown a photo lineup by the police department. And when asked why he hadn't identified Alan, you know, 20 years beforehand, um, Manigou said that he'd never been shown any of the pictures of the suspects back when the murder had been committed. He was just asked if he recognized the names. A lot of people. Yeah, I have heard of like Arthur Lee Allen, how he was a suspect, but I, I know there was one suspect where they said it matched up very well, but it was all circumstantial, and that was why they could never give a mm. actual arrest. It's quite yeah. Um, so just moving on with in the chronicle timeline of these in on uh, on August the second, nineteen sixty nine, the chronicle runs the cipher that came with the first confirmed letter from the Zodiac. Um, the letter writer claims responsibility for all four of the killings, as I said earlier. Um, but this is the first time that the newspapers have actually run the cipher in the letter. I mean, it would have been a lot of publicity for the killer to be getting that sort of thing in a newspaper, but also having that accessible for so many people to try figuring out and still no one got it is kind I think of incredible. The- the, this one that he wrote, like the first cipher that he wrote, did actually get deciphered, and it basically said um, how much he loved killing the people, and it had um, parts of the de- like it had parts of the what do you call it the murders that only the killer could have known, um, mm-hmm. and it's the only zodiac um, cipher that has been de- officially been deciphered. And it basically said, like, my follow-up ciphers will be harder and it will contain my actual name. And no one has been able to, no one has been able to, you know, decipher them. So I guess he did what he said. They do get harder. But, you know, credits to him. It's quite hard to write it. Well, I assume. <laughs> quite hard I to feel write. like that would be a slight giveaway, though, because to be able to write a cipher like that, you would have to be smart. So you would think... They would probably have gone to university and studied probably a maths, and you'd think that would narrow that down a little bit. Well, I mean, that's okay. The whole of America, we're assuming based on statistics that it's a young twenty to thirty-five year old white male. That's still twenty to five, uh, twenty-five to thirty-five year old white males in America who have gone to university and studied maths. Like that's still such a large field of people. Yeah, but to be able to do that, you'd think they'd be getting, like, exceptionally higher grades or doing better than most other people would be. Mm. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. All right, moving on to our next kill, which was uh, just a month after the ciphers were run in the newspaper on September the 26th, 1969, at approximately 6.15 p.m., on the shoreline of Lake Berry, Berryessa, Berryessa, in uh, Napa, California, Cecilia Shepard and Brian Kelvin Hartnett were in their car together, and Cecilia was stabbed ten times, five in the front and five in the back, and Brian was stabbed six times in the back. Um, Brian lived. He didn't die, which is good for him (laughs) um yeah so the knife had a wooden handle and a blade approximately 12 to 10 to 12 inches long this is kind of like interesting to me because this is the first attack he's done without a gun yeah 
And I feel like it's him getting a little bit more, you know, confident because I feel like when you have a gun in your shoe and so on, it's a lot less personal than when you're stabbing. Cause it's like, it takes it's a lot more work. Yeah. I mean, it just, just me thinking that would be a lot more work. I don't know. I haven't stabbed anyone so I wouldn't be able to. Because, <laughs> I mean, I would hope not, but, um, I feel like we should just add here that we do not condone these people at all. We're oh, yeah, saying, do not, no, serial, serial killing is bad, we just think it's interesting. <laughs> oh. It's just, yeah, we, we really should have just said that at the start. We'll say it at the start next time. Um, um, oh, I got that wrong, sorry. Hmm? Um, the couple weren't in a car this time, they are on a blanket. Um, that... So before uh, Shepard died, oh, both of them stayed alive for about 24 hours and then Cecilia died. But before she died, um, Cecilia told the police that she noticed a man approaching them wearing an, uh, quote, unusual costume and holding a gun. He appeared to be over six feet tall and a heavy build. Um at this point, the Zodiac Killer is getting a little bit more daring. I feel like he's starting to do these attacks earlier during the day and he actually talked to both of the victims this time. He said that he was a prison escapee from Montana or Colorado and he needed money and a car in order to flee to Mexico. Um, obviously, scared because he had a gun on him. Uh, Brian, uh, he gave him his wallet and his car keys but they were later, both of those were later found at the scene of the crime. I think Basically, it's really interesting how much that has changed, especially from the first murder, from going from both of them dead, being shot in a car, to one of them surviving and being stabbed instead, like not, even, not in the car either. It seems like a big change. Mm, like he's... It's either it's. I see what you mean when you're talking about you know the theory of two people is it is quite large because you would not think that you know the first crime if you and this crime were if you didn't know that there was a killer who was co- uh, you know saying that he was responsible for both of them you wouldn't think that they would be connected. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So basically, after several minutes of conversation, the man tied the coupled together with a plastic clothesline and began stabbing them. Um, Something may be interesting. I don't know if you look at it from a psychological point of view. Brian was attacked first and then Cecilia was, and that seems to be the same for a lot of the crimes. The man is attacked first and then the woman is attacked. I feel Um, like a reason that the killer might have done that is because the man, especially back then, would have posed a much larger threat to him if they were able to escape and get to him or be able to, like, save themselves and identify him or something. Save themselves. We'll leave the... <laughs> oh, no, it's like the damsel in distress. <laughs> I don't know. There was a lot of weird views on masculinity back in nineteen Yeah, would not want to go back there. <laughs> Go back? I haven't been there. <laughs> Tig, you want to tell me something? Uh, no, it's all good. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, so um, after attacking both of them, the man just walked away from the scene. Um, after several minutes, the fisherman heard the couple screaming, and instead of going to them, he went and alerted the park rangers first, which I feel like... Surely, if you hear someone screaming, wouldn't you go and help them and then call the officials? Like the I mean, but you'd be putting yourself in danger. Like if you, if they're screaming and you know, oh, they're probably in danger. You go to someone that would more likely have a weapon instead of possibly putting yourself into that sort of danger as well. But they could just be like screaming at a bug or something like you surely you would just at least like check i feel like screaming at a bug and screaming about getting (laughs) killed would be two very different things i don't know but the man's not there at this point right so they'd be screaming help me so wouldn't you go over and help them or i don't know who knows what this 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 fisherman decided to do um 
And then just about an hour after the attack, they re- the police department received a phone call from the man who claimed to be responsible again. This time they did manage to trace the phone call to a phone booth in Napa and some fingerprints were recovered. Um, but that, it didn't really go anywhere because this was back when they didn't have, fingerprinting was still new. They didn't have a lot of fingerprints actually on their database at the time. It was more just something that they could use as a... Like, if so, if they did catch someone, then they could, you know, look at the fingerprints and compare them. Um, this is quite interesting, though, because this attack, it wasn't done in a car, yet all the, when the sheriff's department responded to the attack and they got to the scene of the crime, they found that the killer had written a message on the car door, the victim's car door, Uh, The message was the dates of the Fade Jensen murder and the Theron Manigou attacks, and it was signed with a cross circle symbol. Um, And, like, a lot of people, that image of the car door with the, um, what do you call it, the car door with the, the, symbol on it became quite famous it got run in newspapers and it was something that became like a symbol of the uh zodiac killer that's the symbol that looks like the uh like if you looked into a sniper rifle that's what you would see isn't it um yeah i'm just trying to find a photo of it yeah so it's just like the circle with the uh like the plus in the middle yeah it's the, um, the, yeah, the circle with the cross in, in the middle. You know, you know which one I'm talking about? You know yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I think it's also really interesting that the last two murders, the men survived. Yeah, like he, he made sure that the women didn't survive, but he didn't really care about the men. Yeah. And, like, I feel like if he if he wanted them to die, they would have died. Mm, I don't know, though. But then what's what's the what's the aim of keeping them alive? Like, what is he trying to prove with that? Like, oh, I could have chosen to kill you, but I didn't. I don't know. I mean, a theory could be that it is a group of people, especially, like, a group of men, and, like, they could have been, like, those two people that didn't die, and that was sort of, like... If they're getting murdered, of course, it's not going to incriminate them. But it could also just be, I don't know, something else. Like, it could stem from a trauma in their childhood or something. That's true. I did hear, I didn't hear it, but I saw a theory that one, I think it's either this killer, the Mike, I think it's either Mike or the second kill. Brian or Mike, they think that they might have, you know, stabbed themselves um, just to, but done it in a way that they knew that they would survive so that it it wouldn't, suspicion wouldn't be thrown on them or something like that. Yeah, because to be stabbed or shot however many times and survive, especially in the 60s, is, it seems you'd have to know what you're doing or be very bad at shooting someone. That is true. Um, or maybe, like, he had a medical background and knew what... I feel like that could be, like, a very big thing that he could have had a medical background because to be... What was he stabbed? Like, four times and he survived that? Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Like, you'd have to be insanely lucky twice in a row to have, like, to just shoot them or stab them in the exact right places that they wouldn't die. I think what's interesting is you were talking about before, you know, with the ciphers, he had to be quite an intellectual person in order to create these ciphers that no one can, no one can decipher. Um, yeah. But just... Do they teach you that in medical school? Medical medical school, like how to stab someone without killing them? I don't know. 
do you think the way universities work in America, don't they um do like an undergraduate thing? So you just go in, do like normal classes and that sort of stuff, and then you can go and do more selective things as you go through college. So you could have started so like you do especially with medicine you'll do a, a base like I think it's four years of medical learning and then you can branch off into the specialist like um I don't know if you want to be a gynecologist or a pediatric or that sort of stuff I mean there's also the thing that they could have done medical school and just as a hobby because some people are just so smart like that um could have yes, done medical school is a hobby oh, no like do like a specialized or advanced maths as a hobby because some people enjoy that I'm sorry I could never but like I know some people do I'm sorry I do specialist maths as a hobby or... there's definitely people that do that <laughs> somewhere surely i mean they probably are but hopefully they're also not the people that go around okay but to be doing a specialist math like advanced maths as a hobby you're probably a psychopath i'm sorry kelvin but like (laughs) (laughs) i don't think i'm necessarily wrong um neither do i actually all right. On the night of October the 11th, 1969, at 9.55 p.m., on the corner of Washington and Cherry Streets in Persido Heights, which is a neighborhood of San Francisco, California, cab driver Paul Stein, who was 29 at the time, was shot once in the head at point-blank range. And this time, what's interesting about this call, there's actually quite a bit that's interesting about this one. First off, it was just a man in the car, and he was older than the rest of the victims. And secondly, there was three witnesses to this crime. I think this further sort of adds to the theory that it wasn't just one person. Yeah, unless it was someone going on a complete psychotic breakdown. Yeah. Like, I don't know. But I feel like someone in a psychotic breakdown couldn't be unless that diapers. Yeah, unless that person had like a split personality or some sort of personality disorder where they could have been having going through a psychotic breakdown, switching between yeah. the personalities. Yeah, the second personality just goes about the same normal. Yeah, I don't it's it's something really interesting and it would have been I think the police probably could have looked at it a little bit more I don't know for sure but I don't think they spent that much time looking at people with um like a having a psychotic break or that sort of stuff because in their eyes a lot of these crimes were very calculated especially with the taunting the police side of it yeah, and I feel like mental illness and stuff was just so taboo, especially in the 60s, that they probably wouldn't have even thought of that or they wouldn't have any sort of record of someone going through a psychotic break. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as we said at the last crime, um, the killer asked for um, the man's keys and wallet, and in this crime, so... Uh, Stein's cab was originally hailed at Mason and Gary Street and it was meant to go to Washington and Maple Street but instead it ended up on Washington and Cheryl's Washington and Cherry Street which was a block away from his destination his wallet and his keys were taken and a lot like a large portion of his shirt had been torn off but carefully not like in a struggle it's like after he had died he'd gone back and torn some of the shirt Um, fingerprints were potentially the subject were recovered from the vehicle and according to the police document a pair of men's size 7 black leather gloves were also found so I said before that this crime was quite unusual because there were three witnesses there had never been any witnesses before this the three witnesses say they watched the subject from about 60 feet away as he wiped down the cab after with a cloth after killing the sign um, they called the police and described a white male, 20 to 5 to 30 years old, 5'11 
five foot eight to five foot nine, stocky build, reddish brown hair, which was worn in a crew cut, heavy rimmed glasses, and dark clothing. Now, the description of this guy compared to the description given to the police by Cecilia Shepherd, who was the last attack, there are a couple of things that are different. For example, Cecilia stated that the man was more than six feet tall, whereas these three witnesses say he was 5'8 at an absolute top. Um, they say that he had a stocky build, whereas Cecilia mentioned that he had a very heavy build. Um, and the partial fingerprints, I don't think, it doesn't really say, but I don't think they match the fingerprints at the phone booth of the last crime, which I feel like just further supports the theory, the theory that there are two or more killers. I mean... It was, it's really interesting because I was watching um, American Horror Story the other week. I, it was the cult series, so it's set around 2016, and they do mention, like, the Zodiac Killer in them, and the way they frame it is it was part, like, it was actually an organization of people called Scum, I think. It was very... Um, extremist feminists sort of they were out to kill most men and they started with uh, couples because like okay so these women support the men because they're in a couple and it makes them less likely to be uh, like less likely for the police to figure out what they're doing straight away sort of thing and I mean I feel like that theory it like the way they put that is a little bit far-fetched possibly but to have a group of... Just because the two people that survived the previous attacks were the men. Like, if it hadn't been the two women that survived, I feel like it would support that theory a lot more. Yeah. I mean, like, it's interesting to watch. Definitely go watch American Horror Story. I, But just the theory that it was two or more people doing it, I think that's really interesting because I feel like there's just so many inconsistencies in each of the crimes. Mm. Um, just wanted to note that you know how I said earlier with Mike and how the police handled that and how they said that they hadn't he hadn't been shown any of this like a photo of any of the suspects until twenty years later. Yeah. Um, this crime probably has one of the biggest like police mishaps in it ever. Um, so patrol officers. Donald Fork and Eric Zelms were driving towards the attack and um, the way, so the witnesses said that they saw the man walking down Cherry Street and the police dispatchers came from Cherry Street and unfortunately they had mistakenly described the suspect as a black male. So when they drove past, um, they didn't stop and question um, the Zodiac Killer walking down the street, which I feel like, imagine committing a murder, right, cleaning up after yourself, you're wiping down the car, and then it, you just walk past the police dispatch going to your murders, like your murder crime scene, whatever. Like, imagine what he must have been feeling. That's just... I feel like... I, I definitely read about that and I thought that was really interesting how they had messed up that much but also the uh, amount of racism that was in the 60s and still exists now I sort of see how they messed that up so easily mm. but like I feel like someone like that wouldn't even blink an eye if the police went past them well, they not only went past them, they actually stopped and talked to the man. Um, they had, he was quite cheery. He had put on a pair of glasses. He wasn't carrying anything. Um, it's, yeah, it's really strange. I feel like someone like that, to be able to shoot a person and wipe down your crime scene while there are people watching you have 
an incredibly big god complex and you're not even going to bat an eye when the police talk to you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so originally this killing was, was not thought to be a Zodiac killing. They thought it was just a cabby robbery gone wrong. Um, however, on October the 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from the Zodiac containing that portion of shirt that, you know, I said he ripped off earlier. Yeah. And he took credit for the killing. Um, the inspectors that were working on the case, Dave Tosani and Bill Armstrong, um, were actually quite shocked to realize that this shirt belonged to Stein. Um, and the Zodiac claimed that he spoke to the patrolman and he led them astray. Um, and something that I just wanted to mention as well, it took Officer Ferg, who I said before was one of the patrol officers that um, saw the Zodiac Killer walking down, it took him over a month to go to the his, I don't know, officer in charge and tell him that he actually, you know, had an encounter with the killer and he talked to and I like I understand that's a, that's a big thing to do, but surely once you realized your mistake, you would tell them immediately. Like it just makes it worse if you lead it for so much longer. Yeah, and that like especially a mistake like that, I feel like they could have gone so much further in the investigation if that had been brought up earlier. That's true. I don't know. Just I, I feel like. The reason, uh, one of the main reasons that the Zodiac Killer is still unknown today was just because the police department in this time was so probably not ready or not used to something like this coming through. So there was a lot of mistreatment of evidence and things like that and just the way that they spoke to witnesses and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I feel like especially... Even up until probably the 80s or 90s, especially in small towns, it was so hard to track down and find serial killers because police stations in small towns were not equipped for this sort of thing. You always hear the stories of like, oh, a small town, like we knew everyone would keep our doors unlocked at night, like it's so safe here up until something like that does happen. Mm. And then, and then it's kind of sad because the small towns, you know, they, they'll they never leave their doors unlocked again and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. I don't know, I feel like if you're leaving your doors unlocked at night, you're probably... <laughs> I'm joking, it's... Okay, October the 22nd, 1969, a man claim, calls up the Oakland Police Department and he claims to be the Zodiac. He says that he wants to talk to the San Francisco attorney, Melvin Valeri, on the TV, on a TV talk show. Valeri takes the call on the show and agrees to meet the caller in front of the shop in Daly City. The caller does not show up, he just doesn't come, and the police determine that he did, wasn't the Zodiac. I feel like with something like this, you know, there would be so many copycats and people being like, oh, that's me. I'm him. Yeah, because just the amount of fame and media coverage that Zodiac Killer got, everyone wants the five minutes. Mm, the five minutes of fame. Yeah. Because at this time, the Zodiac Killer, he's getting a lot of media attention. Um, you know, these cryptograms are trying to be figured out by some of the biggest brains in the country. Um, he's taunting the police and, like, it's such a... It's such a public um, sort of arena in which he conducts his crimes and in which he calls in on himself and he reports himself in and all that sort of stuff. It's like he, he, he loves the media attention. So, yeah. moving on. So, in on November the 12th, 1969, the Chronicle receives receives and publishes a new cryptogram um, included with a letter from the Zodiac. Um, in the letter, he claims credit for two more murders, bringing the total to seven, but despite this and later boasts that will come, the police will only officially attribute five killings to the Zodiac. 
Um, so the cipher is, and all of his letters are now signed with his symbol at the bottom, the circle with a cross going through it. And he's kind of decided that that's his, like, that's his thing. He's going to stick with that. That's going to be his little quirk. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, and then a month later, on December the 27th, which is the day after Christmas, I feel like he should have waited. He should have taken Christmas off. I mean, come on. He gets, the police get a letter from Beleri, who was the attorney who spoke to the fake um, Zodiac Killer and agreed to meet him. Um, on the, He received a letter on December the 20th, which the police have um, said is authentic. And in the letter it says, please help me, I'm drowning. And it includes a piece, another piece of blood soaked cloth, which is identified to have come from the shirt that Stein was wearing during his robbery. It'd be terrifying to receive that letter. Absolutely. Like, just, whoa. Just imagine, you know, just going through your morning post. You're like, ah, oh, bills, bills. Ah. Oh. This includes a piece of blood soaked t shirt from a man that was shot in the back of the head. A little bit terrifying. I would be a bit terrified. Yeah, I, I don't know how I would deal with that. That's. Um, so what follows after 1969 is a bunch of murders and um, letters that I'll probably just quickly go through. But the police have attributed that none of the following murders were actually the Zodiac Killer. So on January the 25th, 1970, a San Francisco cab driver named Jane, oh, sorry, not James Charles, Charles Jarman. <laughs> was shot just a few, few blocks away from where Stein was killed. The police say it's not the Zodiac. However, the Yellow Cab Company offers a $1,000 reward for information um, on the Zodiac. Then on March the 22nd, 1970, Kathleen Johns, age 22, is driving with her newborn daughter on Highway 132 um, when a driver flashes his headlights at them. Um, Kathleen pulls over, probably to help the other driver, um, uh, but he kidnaps them and drives them around for a couple of hours. Um, Kathleen escapes with her baby when the car finally stops, and she later identifies her kidnapper as... The same man who the, the witnesses, you know, they made an artist sketch and she identifies him as that same man. Um, about several weeks, wait, several weeks later, the Zodiac sends a letter to the Chronicle and claims credit for the kidnapping. Police once again never officially attribute the incident to the Zodiac. Then, on April the 22nd, 1970, the Chronicle reports receiving another letter from the Zodiac. I feel like they're pen pals at this point. <laughs> he claims to have now killed 10 people. The letter ends with, P.S. I hope you're having, having fun. Hang on. P.S. I hope you have fun trying to figure out who I killed. But figure is spelled F-I-G-G-U-R-E. So maybe he wasn't a medical slash maths. I don't know, maths people can't spell, can they? Uh, I don't know, I'm not a maths person. <laughs> so the letter, I have a bit of the letter here. It says, this is the Zodiac speaking. By the way, have you cracked the last cipher I sent you? My name is, and then he has a line there, and the cipher. Um, he goes, I am mildly, I think that's meant to be curious as to how much money you have on my head now. I hope you do not think that I was the one who wiped out that blue meanie with a bomb at the cop station. It's a very casual letter. It really is. It's like it's like they're pen pals. Yeah. Like he's 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 like 
and even just the start, you know, this is the Zodiac speaking. Like, hey, what's up? It's me again. But it's, it's very strange. Like, he obviously, I don't know if it was just the time or, but he, like, he doesn't have, it, it, the sentences are very simple. Like, you, you see some serial killers and they're so intelligent and they, they like, when they write things down or when they talk, they, they they speak in very complex terms. Yeah, it's very simple. It's like if you were writing a note to your friend on what you were going to eat for lunch tomorrow. It's just <clears throat> so interesting and so very different to, like, the sci-fi. Exactly, exactly. And we now, on October the 12th, so he had a bit of a break. <laughs> so little hiatus. He waited a while before sending another, this one's a postcard, not a letter. On October the 12th, the Conical reports to have receiving a postcard from the Zodiac with 13 holes punched out. And it says, Dear Editor, you'll hate me, but I've got to tell you, the pace isn't any slower. In fact, it's just one big 13. Some of them thought it was horrible. Um, and then it's Zodiac, and he has his sign on it. And it says, P.S. There are reports. Hang on, it's written upside down. <laughs> <laughs> there are reports. City police, pig cops are closing in on me. I'm crack proof. What is the price tag now? And it's written, it's not actually written, handwritten like the others are. He's taken like little bits of um, the newspaper and put it together like, you know, you do in class or whatever they were one of the first ones to actually start doing that weren't they yeah like i could just just imagine him sitting at his little desk <laughs> and a whole bunch of newspapers like oh craft time starts cutting them up and pacing i don't know why he had to write the ps upside down like yeah, kind of rude yeah it's making it just, difficult <laughs> just as a note he also has a symbol of a cross in the middle of the postcard underneath the numbers 13. And then October the 27th, so a little bit after the Chronicle reported that they had received this letter, the Zodiac sends the crime reporter Paul Avery a Halloween card telling him you are doomed. But why don't we send people Halloween cards anymore? Um... I don't know. We should start doing it. Just maybe not, you know, don't really want to receive one from a serial killer telling me I'm doing I mean, it would be a fun time. Have something interesting happen. <laughs> How scared would you be on Halloween, though? So he received this letter on the 27th. Oh, sorry, the Halloween card on the 27th. Imagine waiting, you know, the 28th. The 29th, the 30th, the 31st, the night of the 31st, imagine how scared he would have been. That would be terrifying, especially like when you've got lots of people running around neighborhoods. That, that, I feel like Halloween would be a big night for serial killers, honestly. We should look into that. That should be like a Halloween special. <laughs> All right, we'll make a Halloween special. Okay, sounds kind of fun. <laughs> On November the 16th, the Chronicle runs a story which points out the similarities between the Zodiac killings and the 1966 murder of a university student, Cherry Joe Bates. The police don't identify Bates as a Zodiac victim. But it's kind of interesting that they're saying that, you know, he could have been murdering before 1968. His first, his first one, I think it was. Yeah. And then on March 16th, 1971 so it's now been two and a half years since the first killing the chronicle reports that the los angeles time have received a letter from the zodiac who was silent for five months he now claims that there are 17 victims and says that the bates murder so the um you know the university student from 1966 was actually him and the letter reads, this is the Zodiac speaking. Like I have always said, I am, wait, I'm on exact proof. 
if the blue meanies, so the blue meanies of the police, are even going, uh, oh my gosh, this is so hard to read. If the <laughs> blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they had best get off their, I think that says fat bums, but it's been like scribbled out. And then it just says, and do something. Because the longer they fiddle around, the more slaves I will collect for my afterlife. I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my riverside activity, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more from there. The reason that I'm writing to the Times is this. They don't something me on the I can't read the rest of that but it now at the bottom it has his symbol and 17 and plus I think one of the interesting things about this is he calls the people that he kills slaves that he's collecting for his afterlife yeah he seems like from a few of the things I've heard he seems like a uh not a religious but uh What's it called? I um like you know how they you know how someone's like oh you can't go near a black black cat like that's bad luck like mm. uh, I can't remember the word and it's going to annoy me but just like yeah I can't remember the word. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, just as a, I'm going to close this up a little bit. On January the 31st, 1974, the Chronicle reports it has received a letter from the Zodiac. It is the first letter in roughly three years. By this point, he claims to have 37 victims. It says, I saw, I think, The Exorcist. It was the best satirical comedy that I've ever seen. Signed, yours truly. He plunged himself into the billowy weed and an echo arose from the suicide's grove. Twitwillow, twitwillow, twitwillow. P.S. If I do not see this note in your paper, I will do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of doing. Me, and then it's my, it's me is 37, and the San Francisco Police, San Francisco Police Department, zero. Hmm. And then after that, we have a lot of uh, suspected killings. Um, Quite a few movies are made on the serial killer. Um, The police look into a number of suspects who all turn out to not be him. Honestly, he kind of just captivates the, um, the, the, the world. But nothing ever comes of it. He doesn't send any more letters. He doesn't um, attribute to killing any more people. Um, at one point on May the 4th, 2018, the San Francisco Police Department think that they may have some DNA, but eventually it doesn't really lead to anything. And since then, it's kind of just fizzled out. I think it's really interesting how they just disappeared from the face of the earth, pretty much. Like, a, a person who had such... He, not for the good reasons, but he had, was very public, and the things he did were very public. For him to just completely disappear, mm. quite interesting. You sort of got to think: Did they just stop because they thought well, we're ahead? Maybe we shouldn't do anymore, or did they just die? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like he might have died. You know, he might have been in a crash and he couldn't do anything. I guess we'll never really know what happened to the Zodiac Killer. Honestly, I think it's more terrifying when you don't know who did it. He could be your next door neighbour. Oh, well, I sure hope world. not. <laughs> we'll just pray he didn't move to Australia. <laughs> um, anyway, to wrap that up, I just want to shout out Anchor because that's who we're making our podcast through and also shout out Calvin's podcast, The Pastor Pod, go check that out. We did a 
crime show on there the other week, I think it was. So definitely go listen to his stuff. Anyway, I think that's it. Have you any more to add? Um, I don't think so. I think this this one is quite interesting in the fact that it's an unsolved case. Mm. Um, I really enjoyed researching it and, you know, the theories behind it and how, you know, there was such a strong cause for the fact that it was more than one person or it was one person who wrote the letters and took credit for the killings of the other people. Um, I don't think, yeah, it's been really interesting. Come back next week and we'll have our Halloween special. Yeah. Because I think next week is Halloween. Uh, next Thursday is like two days before Halloween, so yeah. Perfect. It'll be spooky. Spooky time. Anyway. Thank you.